Hello, can you hear me? David? Yes, Jetsun Ma. Okay, sorry Welcome. about that. Goodness me, what a kerfuffle. <laughs> it's okay, people have took them, uh, the chance to uh, sit to a quiet meditation and everybody behaved really nicely. I'm really so, uh, sorry. Good. <laughs> And it's great you made it. Welcome. It's wonderful to have you here with us again. And we all feel very much grateful, fortunate and excited over this opportunity. And uh, over the years and through your visits and encounters with Israeli Dharma practitioners, you have been a great inspiration to us, both for those who actually received teachings from you, read your books or met you personally and received advice on how to practice wisdom and compassion in skillful ways. And it really means a lot to us to meet you um, on uh, such a worrying and troubled times as we all go through. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, David. Very good. So sorry, um, we can run over time if that's all right with you. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, good. Okay, so uh, before we begin, I just like to stress that uh, Jetsun Ma did have the chance to read the questions that will be presented exactly as they were sent to us, but uh, for practical reasons, some of them will be presented in a slightly abbreviated version for the purpose of saving time and uh, allowing Jetsun Ma to uh, answer as much questions as possible. So if it's okay with you, Jetsun Ma, we'll begin right away with the first question, okay? So we'll begin with questions regarding coping with disturbing emotions and uh, generating positive ones. The first question is anonymous and it reads, How Buddhism explains anxiety attacks? What is the Buddhist remedy for it? Are there any recommended meditations or recommended teachings on this subject? Well, of course, um, specifically, there isn't any particular text which deals with anxiety attacks in Buddhism, as far as I know, no. But um, there are books by Yonge Mingyu Rinpoche, who himself um, suffered from very serious um, panic attacks from early childhood into his adolescence. And even though he was a tuku and his father was a high lama, nonetheless, he had um, a whole history of, of very debilitating panic attacks. So you can read about that and how he dealt with it because now he's completely confident. Um, in his books, The Joy of Living, and Joyful Wisdom, that's Mingyur Rinpoche. Um, so th that could be helpful to know that, you know, there is a cure, but it takes time. I think that's the main point, that um, when intense feelings arise, the important thing is not to try to suppress them. As much as possible, one should just try to relax, be mindful, and, and welcome them. Uh, listen. To, I mean, not just panic attacks and anxiety, but fear, anger, any strong emotions. People imagine that meditation leads to calmness and peace, but often, in fact, it, it opens the door to very powerful emotions coming up. And the important thing is not to, to try to push them down again or avoid them, but to, to open ourselves to listening to them, to make friends with them, to ask them what's the problem. And maybe just lie down and, and just relax from the top of the head to the soles of the feet and allow where in the body is these feelings coming? How, what does it feel like? How is it? And, and try to, you know, enfold them with, with compassion rather than with, with um, avoidance and aversion. And again, if people really suffer debilitating attacks of panic or anxiety or any other real traumatic feelings. I think they should go and find a sympathetic understanding psychotherapist 
to find out what is the cause of these feelings and help them to deal with it, both from the point of view of psychiatry and from the point of view of, of the Dharma. You know, the two can go together because meditation is not um, a substitute for psychotherapy, actually. It can bring up a lot of intense feelings, which actually are too difficult for people to deal with by themselves. They need someone skillful to help them through this. So, um, yeah, so I would say befriend your feelings, however intense and difficult they may be. Listen to them, try to hear what they're trying to tell us and relax and if necessary, find a, a good spiritual minded psychotherapist to, to help hold your hand through. But the point is that we can change, we can overcome these feelings, but it takes a lot of skill and, and uh, not understanding how to do this in a way which doesn't create more problems. So sorry, that's not too helpful, but I mean, I think that relax, make friends, and find a psychotherapist would be my um, advice. Thank you, Jetsunma. The second question is a very personal one, yet it bears great relevance for us all. It's from Hila, and it says, my mother is dying of cancer. We have a complicated relationship. It is important for me to be there for her and to relieve her of as much suffering as possible, but I struggle with feeling forgiveness, love, and compassion towards her. What can I do to evoke those feelings so that I will be able to accompany my mother on her final journey? Well, she has already answered her own question. What she needs to do is cultivate loving kindness and compassion. And uh, if her mother is a difficult subject for her, then that is all the more um, incentive to really practice. And at the same time, she could practice Tonglen, you know, um, taking in the suffering, giving out well-being. And no matter what resistance we feel to that, you know, sometimes we feel a lot of resistance to feeling love and compassion towards certain people, even our own mother, then we should have love and compassion also towards those feelings, you know, and, and slowly work at it just a little at a time, not, not pushing it too hard, but maybe just when she's especially suffering, just to think how it would be if she were not suffering. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if she was happy and, and, and felt peaceful and at her ease? That's all you're asking, is that you wish that she should be happy and you wish that she should be free from suffering. And just, you know, a few minutes at a time, just wishing that for her, because in your heart, you do wish that for all beings. So what to speak your mother, without your mother, you wouldn't even be here, however difficult she may be. So we have tremendous gratitude to, <coughs> to our parents without whom we wouldn't be here. And just, I mean, most of these questions I'm saying again and again, just cultivate loving kindness and compassion because that is the opening up of the heart. And however much resistance we may feel, gradually, slowly, 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 and also for herself, she should give loving kindness, compassion to herself. That is very, very important. The Buddha said, start with yourself. If we have love, if we make friends with ourselves, all right, just we make friends with ourselves and we wish that we would feel okay, not feel not okay, then from that, we can wish that to all others. I mean, it's very logical actually. Thank you, Jetsunma, it does make a lot of sense. The next question is from Arit that asks, how can we increase the sense of solidarity and empathy between groups like men and women, Arabs and Jews, blacks and white? Okay, well, I think that's quite simple. We all have Buddha nature, right? 
So it's only our ordinary conceptual mind which makes all this distinction. And our ordinary conceptual thinking mind is based on our ego, which by its very nature is ignorant. Our ignorant ego, egoistic thinking creates separation. There's me and everyone else who is not me. So then within the, all the not me's, there are those who are my tribe and those who are not my tribe, right? This is, by, this is our fundamental ignorance. When we realize the true nature, our own true nature, the true nature of everything, then there is no separation. And this is very important to remember. Truth has no separation. It's untruth, falsehood, which separates. And so at a fundamental level, we are all very much... We're, we're all very much, you know, much of a muchness. We're all interconnected at a very, very profound level. So then again, recognize that just as I would like to be happy and not miserable, all beings want to be happy and not miserable. Not just human beings, animals, birds, anything, fish. All living creatures wish for happiness and do not want to suffer. We have that very much in common. That's what unites us. So then it's very easy to have, you know, loving kindness first towards ourselves, then towards those we love and we feel easy about, wishing them just to feel good, just to feel well. Wouldn't that be lovely if people felt were happy and content in some time themselves and didn't have to suffer? And then people we feel neutral towards that we never really thought whether they're happy or not happy, recognizing they also would like to be happy. And then people that we have problems with, that we, we consider the other. Let them be happy. How wonderful if everybody could be at peace within themselves. Wouldn't that be lovely? How could we not wish that for everybody? And recognizing under the skin, we're really all very alike. There's not that much difference. So, you know, if you just, we just sit and think about it, we can see how we ourselves are creating the problem and we ourselves are the solution. Okay, thank you, Jetsunma. The next question is from Mir who says, I teach young adults before their army service, ages 18, 19, a course on dealing with difficult emotions. These youngsters have no previous background in Buddhism or meditation techniques. What would you recommend me to do in order for me to teach them skillfully the enormous benefits of dealing adeptly with kleshas or disturbing emotions? <laughs> Well, um, of course, I think it's very important to teach young people mindfulness and meditation. In those schools where they are teaching mindfulness and meditation, not only to the students, but also to the teachers, I have heard again and again how it's just been such a complete change in the whole attitude, the whole atmosphere, that now they say they don't know how they ever manage without it. It helps everybody, not just when you're at school, but throughout life, just to become more aware, more present. You know, not swept along by all our thoughts and emotions, but actually experiencing the moment. And basic meditation, shamatha meditation on the breath and things like this, you know, help them to recognize their negative thinking. When it arises, you know, understanding it causes pain and problems to ourselves and to others because our negative thinking then extends to our speech and to our actions. All our speech and actions depend on the mind, the intention. The Buddha said that karma is intention, karma meaning action. So, our intentions are either positive or negative. I think it's maybe a good idea sometimes altogether 
to watch a, a movie, a popular movie, and just identify all the clashes which are being shown, not just by the baddies, by the villains, but by the heroes. You know, their greed, their lust, their anger, their jealousy, their pride. You know, there it is. Look at that. You know, you can see it. They, they you know, glorify the clashes. And that's what is causing the problem. Of course, the problems are what make the movie. But if they only acted more skillfully, you know, they, they would be a whole different story, isn't it? So get those young people looking at their minds and identifying the good, generosity, kindness, thoughtfulness, consideration, and so forth, empathy, and also the negative, our greed and lust and anger and, and competitiveness, jealousies, and so forth, all based on our total lack of understanding. Thank you, Jason Ma. The next question, Leanne shares with us an experience from her personal practice and says, I started a journey a year ago to practice till I'll be less angry toward the violent place I live in and toward the people responsible for spreading hatred. It helped. However, since my personal life is so satisfying, I no longer fight for any political issues. I'm no longer an activist. My motivation is gone. Uh, the Dalai Lama says in his tiny book called Be Angry, Anger toward social injustice will remain until the goal is achieved. From my experience, practice makes us less angry. Of course, there are other motivations to change unjust social structures, such as love and compassion, but anger is a very strong motivation as well. How can we not lose anger that might be necessary in order to stay alert and correct wrongs? Well, honestly, I, I think that compassion, genuine compassion, is a much stronger motivation than, um, you know, it's a much stronger emotion for overcoming social injustices. So the problem with anger or righteous indignation is that it, it can blind us to seeing the problem with clear vision. We hate the oppressor. And so we don't listen to them. We don't try to understand things from their point of view. We only see our point of view. So we have very narrow vision. And this is um, when we face people with anger in our heart, that ignites the anger and resistance in their heart. So you end up being to oppositions. I mean, this is what all the wars, all the fights are about. It's I'm right. So you must be wrong because you don't agree with me. And then how can there ever be reconciliation? How can there ever be compromise? How can there ever be a real, yeah, a real resolution of the problems? Because we are two opposing forces and that doesn't just creates more and more and more of the same. They will be more entrenched because we're not listening to them and their point of view. We are then more entrenched and I don't see that anger helps. What we need is fearless compassion like Tara or Chinrezik. Chinrezik, as we know, the Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva compassion, all white, holding a lotus, smiling, sweet. But his other side, his alter ego, is Mahakala, who is black and wrathful. But he's not angry. He just manifests that form in order, because of his great compassion, because he's Chinrezik. He's Chinresic pretending to be wrathful, like a mother with a naughty child. Sometimes she has to, you know, smack the child and, and shout at it, not because she hates it, not because she wants to hurt it, but because her compassion sees that that child is going to cause a lot of trouble for itself and others 
like maybe reaching towards a hot pot or something, you know? And if you say, darling, don't hit reach that pot, it will burn you. It's going to do it all the more. So then you have to, you know, shout and say, don't touch that pot. And then, oh, you know, but mostly, mostly, compassion is an incredible force for the good. And it does not create waves of antipathy. It does not create waves of um, retaliation. If we are genuinely compassionate, our heart is open to embrace, then we listen. We don't just shout down the other person, we listen. Well, why are you doing what you are doing? What is your reason for that? And then within that compromise and talking, there could be some kind of reconciliation towards it, you know, because they are then all their defenses come down. And they from their side then might also be willing to listen. And in that way, one can reach a resolution without it being, you know, that we have to pulverize the other person because we're right, which is just another ego stance, really. You know, um, that the ego gets inflated with his own self-righteousness. And we can always find an object to be angry about. That's the other problem. If one thing gets righted, we'll find someone else to you know, direct all our inner anger outwards. And that does not resolve anger. It just adds more oil to the fire. So lady, please, or gentleman, whichever, everybody, please arouse more compassion. And that compassion will move us to try to, you know, right social injustices and um and the wisdom that goes with the compassion because a lot of people are very very compassionate but get burned out because of all the problems and they don't know how to dissolve those problems you know so it just sits like a big heavy lump inside and and this is where wisdom is needed to dissolve that so that as that comes in the, the, the compassion arouses within, but at the same time, it is um, seen, seen through without being solidified through our deeper insight and understanding. So this is why compassion and wisdom have to go together. But that can deal with so many problems in a skillful way, because we have to act skillfully, not from the negative emotions, which only create more negative emotions. So she should work on her compassion and wisdom. <laughs> Always a good advice, Jetsuma. Thank Always you. Always a good advice. <laughs> the next question is from Hadar that asks, how do I increase the sense of being satisfied with myself and with what I do to help others, to help other people? Uh, decreasing the need to hear that I have positive influence on the people I help, the need to be recognized? Well, my feeling is that this, uh, this person is not really at peace with herself and not really friends with herself. And for that reason, she needs the endorsement of others. If we're really at peace with ourselves, we don't need other people to praise us for anything. We just do what we do because we are doing it. And that's enough. However, in Buddhism, there is also the quality of mudita. And mudita means altruistic joy. So along with our loving kindness and our compassion, the next thing comes rejoicing. Rejoicing in, in goodness. And that means rejoicing not only in the goodness of others, which there is so much, and we forget, we overlook, we only think about all the bad things which are happening in the world. There's so much beautiful, beautiful things happening in the world too. Beautiful people doing beautiful, beautiful things. And that could include also ourselves. So it is not that we don't have to say, well done, when we do something good. We rejoice in the fact that we have done something good, just as we rejoice in the, the goodness when we see it in others. 
that sense of, of lifting the heart to goodness. Look, isn't that wonderful? That's no problem with that. It's not regarded as being um, prideful. It's regarded as being encouraging. If we uh, acknowledge our own good deeds, we are encouraged to do more good deeds, right? So while we feel remorse and regret for the, the wrong that we do, we also rejoice in the goodness. So that's no problem. You know, in, if you think of our heart as like a garden, then while we are pulling out the weeds of all our klesha, of all our negative emotions, we also have to water and fertilize and appreciate the flowers. Because, you know, it's not just weeding. You know, we, we, we are weeding in order to give our flowers, the flowers of the heart, more room to grow. And so we should appreciate anything that we do, which is helpful and kind and generous and good. We should say thank you to ourselves. You know, we have to encourage ourselves. And so I wouldn't worry, but only I would, I would be a little bit careful about needing the praise of others. We don't need others' praise, but we do need to, um, to encourage ourselves in our own goodness by noticing it and saying, well done, more, you can do more. Come on, you can do more. Yeah, good. Thank you, Jetsunma. And then we have another question from Adara that reads, how can we get close to the people from the other side of the political map and try to change their attitude or position from constant sense of fear and insecurity or threat to trust and being secure and uh, to supporting and even demanding a peace process? Try working on your government first. You know, I mean, honestly and truthfully, um, I think all these poor Palestinians um, have a, a reason for feeling anxious and mistrustful and, um, you know, full of fear. They, they, they have a reason for it. I mean, I would say start small, start small. Any Palestinians you know, be nice from the heart, smile. If they're doing something nice, say thank you, you know, start small. Any animal which has been habitually mistreated will respond with aggression and fear. And we are animals. So if we are habitually mistreated, then we are going to be mistrustful. We are going to feel, you know, fear when you meet someone who you know can harm you and get away with it in a way that you would not be able to do. There are too many wounds to be healed overnight just by clicking your fingers and being friendly. So tell, make friends with like-minded Palestinians who likewise would like to bridge this gap between us as human beings. We are all human beings. We all have Buddha nature. I mean, there's no difference between the Buddha nature of one person and another, Israelis or Palestinians. Everyone has the same old Buddha nature. It's not my Buddha nature is better than your Buddha nature, you know, it's just Buddha, it, it's the innate pristine consciousness, a pristine, pure, non-dualistic awareness. That's what it is. It's the same for everybody. This is why it's compared to the sky. But it takes time to establish trust. Why should they trust? They have been betrayed so many times. Why was there to trust there, you know? So maybe in your workplace or in your social media or whatever like that, then, you know, try to, try just to, from your heart, just treat them like, like you, you would wish yourself to be treated, right? Do unto others as you would have them do to yourself. Don't do unto others what you would not have them do to yourselves. That is a very, very established understanding in all religions. 
Don't do to other people what you would not want other people to do to you. And then it's so easy, you know? We're not going to solve the problem overnight. It's a very deep historical problem with very, very, very deep wounds. But on a person-to-person -person level, much can be accomplished, even just with a smile. You know, smile. Be friendly. Show that, you, you know, you don't have any hidden weapons of the heart. You know? I mean, it, it, in, the governments are never going to solve these problems. The governments have their own agenda. But human beings between themselves can set up links, of course. They can make that. They're the bridge. Thank you, Jetson Ma. The next couple of questions are regarding coping with our self-grasping and uh, wrong perceptions of reality. The first one is from Shuki, who says, During your 2016 visit in Israel, you told me, and I quote, if I may, practicing Buddhism is an ego-bashing experience. Bashing the ego sounds like almost promotion of violence towards the ego, rather than using a more balanced approach that includes compassion, perhaps. Could Jetsuma elaborate on this, please? So, you know, the Dharma, the point is that the Dharma is always anti-ego, right? And uh, there's always a lot of talk about the self-cherishing mind and going beyond the ego and the ignorance of the ego, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I meant by ego bashing. They never praise the ego. But in fact, she is quite right. Because actually, in order to walk the path to no self, we need a very healthy and confident self. After all, who is walking the path? We are walking the path, right? Who is saying there is no self? Well, the self is saying there is no self, right? So, I mean, the point is that we need a very healthy and balanced sense of ego, of self, in order to walk the path towards selflessness. And the Buddha himself, although he's always talking about no self, no self, no self, anatta, anatma, anatma, nonetheless, he starts by teaching shamatha meditation, for which we will help us to develop a very healthy and well-balanced psyche, right? The, and then with Vipassana, we can start dismantling our idea of self. But first, we have a very well, healthy, well-balanced sense of self. And then he also, of course, teaches loving kindness, compassion, and uh, altruistic joy, etc. Who are they directed to? You start with yourself. Now, we are not sending loving kindness and compassion to the nature of the mind, to our Buddha nature. That doesn't need our loving kindness and compassion. It is loving kindness and compassion. So who are we sending it to? We're sending it to this poor little me sitting there feeling really discouraged because we're never going to be able to learn how to meditate properly and we're never going to see the nature of the mind. And this Buddhist philosophy is just too much. We give loving kindness. It's all right. You're okay. You're my friend. You can do it. Yeah, it's all right. I know it's difficult, but we all are in this together. We can do it because we have Buddha nature. It's all right. It's all right. That's who we're doing. We're making the ego feel better. So why? So it can walk the path towards its own dissolution. We have to get the, ourselves to cooperate. Otherwise, we're going to be discouraged at the first obstacle to get the courage to walk the path the whole way through, we have to have, you know, inner courage. And in the beginning, the inner courage is, um, is based on having a strong sense of self. Shantideva says that while pride and arrogance are a klesha, are a, a, an affliction, self-confidence is essential. 
And it's the same word actually in Tibetan. So, I mean, the point is that we have to believe in our own ability to go beyond our conventional self to the ultimate nature, which is beyond self. So yes, although Buddhist texts don't talk like that, the actual techniques are based on first having a, a healthy sense of I. Because also, sometimes I say, if we have, for example, if we injure our leg, we put it in a cast, and then we're always thinking about our leg. You know, we can't walk very well, and we, we, we are not able to, to use it, but we're always thinking about it. If somebody hits it, ow, ow, ow. And so therefore, you know, a, a sick leg is our big concern. We're always thinking leg, leg, leg. As soon as our leg is healed, we can run, skip and jump, but we're not thinking leg. Right? We can use it, it's very useful, but we're not thinking about it because it's healthy. So it's the same with the ego. If the our ego is not healthy, we're always thinking me, 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 me. As soon as we have a healthy sense of self, we're not thinking so much about ourselves, we're thinking about others. So yes, she's right, you know, um, to have a, a, a good sense of, of, of ego is, very necessary to walk the path towards non-ego. Thank you, Jetsunma. That sounds really practical. Uh, the next one is a short and yet a very essential question from Yitzhak, who asks, why do we have the tendency to not seeing things as they really are? Um, because we identify with our ordinary conceptual consciousness, which by its very nature is dualistic. So this, this creates this sense of an, an ego again, which is solid, enduring, and me, unchanging. And at the same time, everything else outside of ourselves, which is other, which is not really connected with ourselves. We are here, we perceive something else outside of ourselves, which is separate from ourselves. So this very dualistic conceptual thinking is why we don't see things how they really are. Everything gets solidified, everything gets reified. And so then we label it and we judge it, right? We judge and label ourselves, we judge and label other people and other things and other circumstances. So therefore, so therefore, our view is endlessly colored also by our clashes, especially our greed and our aversion. And so we don't see things how they really are. And this is why, with all our likes and dislikes and, and opinions and judgments and, and so forth, we are creating our own reality the whole time. And that is total non-reality. We, we are making the mirage into something which is actually existent, whereas it's just a mirage, causes and conditions coming together. So that is why it is very important to really recognize, to really have some kind of realization of the nature of the mind, which shows us how things are not solid and real, how they are empty in the sense that they are ungraspable and that things are simply not the way we think they are with our dualistic perception. Our fundamental ignorance is so deeply entrenched that it's very difficult to go beyond it, but we cannot get glimpses. And then those glimpses can widen and widen until finally our ability to really, outwardly nothing changes, but our whole, in a relationship with everything changes. It's not that everything disappears, right? You know, suddenly boom, and there's nothing there, just emptiness. It doesn't mean that at all. But it, what it means is that our inner perception changes and we recognize the interconnection with everything, which our conceptual thinking mind divides everything. 
Okay, thank you, Jetsunman. Next few questions are regarding the practice of meditation. And the first one is from Dalit that asks, how do we start the journey to meet our mind? What should we do? Should we look for a teacher or is it enough to meditate every day? Well, <clears throat> nowadays, you know, I mean, things are different from how they used to be traditionally. Traditionally, most people could not read, or if they could read, they could not understand. Nowadays, everyone is educated. They can read, pick up a book, read it, and understand it. So that's the first thing. There are many, many books on meditation nowadays. There are also so many YouTubes, so many every podcasts. I mean, whole meditation uh, courses online nowadays. So the essential need for a teacher is not as as vital as it used to be so but on the other hand i i mean a personal um inter -com communication between a teacher and students is still needed at some at some points i would suggest going to doing group retreats we're, we're under a good teacher um so that they, you get the guidance and at some point you usually can meet the teacher and express any doubts or any questions that you have. This is very, very helpful. Also, you get group energy, you know, um, which helps us to, you know, be invigorated and, and enthusiastic. And also that gives us a discipline. If we practice only by ourselves, it might happen that we get bored or too many th thoughts. And then we think, oh, this is a waste of time. Maybe I'll have a cup of coffee and then come back. And up we get and off we go and that's it. If you're in a group, you can't do that. We have to sit there and, and face all our obstacles and problems. And so this teaches good discipline. Um, so I would say start with shamatha, this calm abiding meditation, because it teaches us how to focus and how to become more aware, how to observe, start with the breath, breathing in, breathing out. There's so much on that nowadays. And learn especially how to cultivate awareness because the, the crux of the whole matter is either we are mindful, we are aware, or we are lost. There's no halfway house. Either we are present and know what's happening or we don't. We are caught and distracted and we are away with the fairies in our mind, in the past, in the future, running around in the present, but not being centered on what is actually happening in the moment. So shamatha can be very, very useful. It's a foundation for all practices which come later. If we have no, if we are distracted, if we have no attention skills, Nothing is going to work, no matter what we do. However, you know, esoteric or uh, whatever, it won't work if we cannot merge our mind with it through our attention. So this is very, very important. It's good to meditate every day, not too long. In the beginning, 10 minutes of focused meditation, better than an hour of distraction. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes, build up, but don't push too hard. Keep it so that when you finish, you could have done more. Then that makes enthusiasm for next time. And uh, try to bring your awareness, the, the mindfulness into the daily life as much as possible so that we have a continuity of the sense of presence and cultivate good heart at the same time. It's not just meditation, it's opening up the heart to be more kind, more thoughtful, more generous, more considerate, more, more all the good feelings inside ourselves. We have to bring those out. And then if a teacher appears, the point is that, you know, these basic practices, anybody can learn to do that. You don't need a high level you know, teacher for that. It's ABC. Why, you know, why bother a, um, a PhD uh, professor 
to teach you how to just learn how to read and write. You don't need that. Once we learn the basic skills, then if we meet a good teacher like that, they can teach us something really meaningful. But a lot of it we can do ourselves. And, and again, in group retreats, that also helps to encourage us on the path to be with others who likewise are focused on, on the same kind of practices. So like that, step by step by step, don't be ambitious. Just take it very, very slowly, but carefully and, and try when we are practicing uh, formally to put your whole heart into it. That's why it's good not to practice too long. And enjoy, because the most important thing is if we do something we enjoy, then it's easy. And even when it's boring or difficult, we just keep going. Okay, thank you, Jetsuma, for all that advice. Uh, the next question is from Hannah, who says, the coronavirus made us stay isolated and avoid new experiences, which made me numb, lack of feeling, and experience lack of concentration. In light of your experience, how do you stay vivid and focused in your meditation? You know, actually, of course, isolation is the perfect opportunity for practice. I mean, that's what everybody's looking for. So now what are you complaining about, right? You know, most people are complaining because they never have a chance. Now we all have this wonderful opportunity to cultivate our meditation and our mindfulness. During the day, if you're by yourself, you can really cultivate everything you do, whether you're cleaning, or cooking, washing up, or whatever we are doing, to do it that little bit more slowly and, and with awareness, with a mindfulness, because there's no distractions now. It's a perfect opportunity to practice. Really, you know, I mean, when it's better. But again, keep your session short and vivid. Don't, if we, if we, push ourselves beyond what feels comfortable. Little bit, sometimes it can be helpful, but if you're not careful, it will create a kind of dullness in, and aversion. Oh God, now I've got to sit down and meditate again. You know, that shouldn't be the feeling. We should say, oh good, now it's meditation time, right? And, and feel, so keep it short. If you're not used to meditating for a long time, keep it short, but but put your whole heart into it while you're doing it. Isn't it wonderful that one has this opportunity to be with the mind? How fantastic, what a blessing. Let's not waste our time being distracted. Let's really try to work at what it matters, which is to be more conscious, more aware, more present, open, spacious, relaxed, but totally present. Sometimes I compare it to a large bird, like an eagle or a falcon. You know, when little birds are, are trying to fly, then they have to flap their wings to keep themselves up. But these big birds, once they get up there, they're just floating being kept up by the air currents, no effort. But they are 100% awake. They're not sleeping. They're completely focused, mostly focused on their lunch, but nonetheless, they are focused. They can see their, their eyes go like 10 miles ahead. They are completely awake, completely aware, but totally relaxed. That's how our meditation should be. Open, spacious, but absolutely focused. Thank you, Jetsunma. The next one is a kind of a follow-up question to that from Ruth that asks how to deal with boredom and restlessness in meditation in order to keep going. So again, I, I repeat that. Just keep your set. If you if you are very get bored or restless, keep your session short. 
but really put yourself into it. During this 10 minutes, I'm genuinely going to do my best, but relax, not tense, right? No, I don't mean I'm going to do my best, you know, but relaxed, but focused, right? 10 minutes, what is that? Come on, we can do that. And just, and then because it's only 10 minutes, we can do many. You know, during the day you have a few minutes off, bring your mind back to watching the breath or observing the mind. You know, five minutes, three minutes. Better to have many multi-minutes than to, just to force yourself beyond, you know, when the mind just gets bored and restless. Then we get in a habit of being bored and restless. So better to get the mind acclimatized, used to being awake and clear, but relaxed. Experiment what works best. Okay, thank you, Jetsunma. The next one is a kind of an opposite question from Shield that would like to inquire what recommendations and preparation would you suggest to someone who would want to go on a long retreat, three plus months focused on shamatha? Well, I would say start with short retreats and do some guided shamatha retreats, you know, with other people first because we need to understand very clearly the technique. If you're going to be away by yourself for some time, then it's important to, um, to know what you're doing. So to understand the, the technique very clearly and before you start to, to know the kind of uh, problems which might come up, the kind of obstacles we might be meeting because we've already done this before, so we know, and get that very clear in your mind how to deal with the obstacles like boredom, restlessness, pain in the body, and so forth like this, how to deal with these things. So that you have the confidence when you go into a longer retreat and these, these problems come up, you know how to deal with them because you've dealt with them before. So try out a month and see how it goes, you know? And start with short sessions and then gradually extend them and extend them. Take some inspiring books with you. Books which will, you know, lift your spirits if you're beginning to flag a bit. And enjoy. I think it's very important when we practice, if we really enjoy our practice, then... Um, you know, anything which we do, if we enjoy it, we don't have to be forced to do it. We, well, the mind goes towards it. You know, there's no resistance. The, the mind delights in it. So therefore, that's why it's good to start short and, and gradually extend. And then don't push too hard. You know, you're not trying to get anything. The other point is there's nothing to gain. So don't start... Um, you know, comparing yourself or thinking, well, what have I got from this? It's not a matter of what we're getting from anything. Just let it be how it is. So don't push too much. And at the same time, don't be too lazy. Be very balanced in practice so we can just keep going. So good. Good luck. Thank you on the off shears. Uh, journey and uh, we have one last question regarding the practice of meditation from Moran that says meditation practice can take many years to adjust and perfect so how does one know which style of meditation is best for him or her before he or she perfected it visualization metta vipassana shamatha mantra etc well i mean first of all we can mix our practices I mean, it's very common to mix uh, shamatha and vipassana and uh, metta and lo loving kindness, compassion, meditations, etc. That they, they all go together very nicely. 
Also, one can mix shamatha and visualizations and mantra recitations. They also go along very nicely. And, you know, certainly in Tibetan Buddhism, most lamas do many different practices. They don't just stick to one. They do a lot of visualization mantra practices, but they also do uh, Mahamudra Dzogchen practices, which um, start again with shamatha and vipassana practices. So good, strong, strong foundation in shamatha. Then, as one lama said, if you have good shamatha, the rest of the dharma is in the palm of your hands. Once we can have a mind which is open, spacious, relaxed, but totally focused on the object of the meditation, then whatever we practice is going to work because our mind will merge with it, with the object. But if we are, have distracted mind, then however long we practice and how, as I said before, however esoteric and profound the practices may be, they won't really connect. They won't transform us because our mind is not at one with them. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, shamatha helps us to completely become one with the object. And the object is not important. What is important is the ability to be completely aware of that object at that time and keep our attention on that object. That's, so the object in itself is not the important thing. The important thing is the ability to be aware. Once we have cultivated that, then we can practice anything and it will have some transformative um, abilities. We, we will feel that something inside us is actually changing, that we are actually moving on the path, really. But I mean, it, you know, a certain amount, uh, we usually have one particular practice, which is the main practice. But after that, it can be embellished by other practices. That, that, there's no harm in that. Okay, thank you, Jetsunma. We're getting closer to the end of our time. If it's okay with you, can we have a couple of more questions? Uh -huh. that are, uh, Steve, it took me forever to get on. It's fair enough that we delay getting off. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So we just have a few questions that are regarding general practice. And the first one is anonymous and it reads, what is the importance of studying the Buddhist philosophy for practitioners whose natural tendency is the practice of the nature of the mind? Um, yes, well, I mean, I'm probably not the best person to ask about that. Uh, actually, it, it really is not that necessary to study Buddhist philosophy if one is not planning to become a Geshe. I mean, in Tibet or in any other place, it's usually only a small selection of monks who actually study Buddhist philosophy. The rest do other things. So, you know, of course we need to understand what is Dharma, what is not Dharma. But even the Dalai Lama's own tutor said to me that at the, at the end of life, what will benefit us most? A head full of book knowledge or genuine realization in the heart. And he said, you know, study three books, including the Bodhicharya Vatara, and well, I was Kaju, so he said Gampopas, um, Jewel Ornament, but some small book on Lamrim. You don't have to go for the whole Lamrim Chenmo, but you know, so get an understanding of what is the Buddhist attitude, what is the Buddhist understanding, and then go away and realize it. Even you can go and retreat and take the books with you. Because at the end of the day, what is going to change us deeply is a genuine realization of the nature of the mind. Nothing else will, will do that. So however subtle, however subtle our intellectual understanding of emptiness is, it is still conceptual thought. It is not the realization of emptiness because the realization of emptiness is beyond thought, beyond concepts. It's the unconditioned, the unborn, the deathless. 
And that can be realized, but it cannot be reasoned about. I mean, yes, you can debate about it forever, but that is not, that is not, that is not going to help you at the time of death. And it's not even really going to help during life. Genuine realization is the only thing which will help, and that can only come through meditation and practice. So if you are intellectually inclined to understand the depths of Buddhist philosophy, it's fantastic and will make our thinking very clear and, and very subtle. But at the end of the day, that alone is not enough. And that can be dropped because what we need is genuine experience. What is the mind? What is a thought? Who is thinking? And beyond thought, what is there? What is the union of emptiness and luminosity? What is it? What does it mean? You can only understand it by realizing and looking inside. So, yes, like that. Practice. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jensen Ma. The next question is a kind of a specific one from Tsunma Karma Suepa, who asks, in the Karma Kaju uh, instructions of Gondru, we were told to do each section separately, reading only the sadhana for that section. Why in Nyingma tradition does one have to read the whole Gondru each time one practices the section they have complete? Has this instruction been updated to meet busy daily schedules? You know, I never heard of that. And I, I don't think it's true. I think it may be a certain Lama told her that um, because every Lama has his own approach. But personally, I never heard that um, where if you do like the Long Ching Ying Tik Mundro, you have to read the whole thing every time, every session. No, you would spend all your time reading. Um, so I would say to that she should just do whatever feels most comfortable for her and not worry. Okay, thank you. The next one is from Yitzchak who says, how can we measure true progress on the Buddha Dharma path and not being diluted by the deep-rooted ego? You know, I don't think we need to measure our progress because that already sounds like the ego, doesn't it? I mean, the ego is saying, Am I getting less egoistic? You know, who is asking? Well, the ego is asking. How can the ego ask if it's getting less egoistic? So I think in general, how can we know if we're making progress? As our mind becomes increasingly more aware, more clear, more relaxed, and at the same time, our heart spontaneously begins to feel more empathy, more kindness, more interconnection with others. So we need to develop this loving awareness, right? And when spontaneously things which otherwise would have made us feel very upset and angry simply don't trouble us anymore, when things which other time we would really have wanted to get into and have and possess, now we could care less. That open, spacious quality of the mind, when that increases and we are spontaneously responding in a way which is kusala, which is skillful, then we can think, yes, we are making some progress on the path. Thank you so much, Jetsun Ma. And on that note, it looks like we've reached the end of our time together. So before we uh, conclude this session, um, I would just like to thank everybody who helped organize this meeting at Dharma Friends of Israel, especially our chairman, Shachar Sagi, and also Liova Kenneth, Gila Penfield, Ikibar Yosef, and all the other board members, volunteers, and devoted practitioners that are helping relentlessly to spread the Dharma in Israel. And also I would like to thank everybody who joined us both in Zoom and on YouTube. 
YouTube and I would like to invite everybody again to practice generosity and support the Dharma and our dear teachers. So for details, please see the link in the chat window or on the F5 website. Um, and above all, Jetsuma, on behalf of myself, the Dharma Friends of Israel and all participants of this meeting, I would like to thank you from the depth of our hearts. Firstly, for being here with us today and giving us this uh, precious time with you and, of course, for sharing the Dharma and your practical advice. And so I wish you good health and really hope you'll stay safe. May all your wishes fulfill swiftly and may you continue to inspire and benefit sentient beings wherever you are. <laughs> and lastly, since we only had one hour, I still have a lot of questions left. Uh, so <laughs> I really hope to, that you will come and give us teachings once again, hopefully even in person and in the near future. And in Hebrew we say Shana Babe Rushalaim, which means next year in Jerusalem, hopefully. <laughs> so thank you, my love. Thank you, David. And thank all the Dharma friends of Israel because you're doing wonderful, wonderful work in very, very difficult circumstances, I know. And well done, all of you. And certainly, I hope that we will meet again in person in the not too distant future. So thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, stay safe. Thank you everybody for joining us and hopefully see you next time around. Indeed. Bye, David.